Good morning, church. How are you all doing this morning? We are so happy to be back here. Me and my family took a vacation down to the beach last week. As I'm sure you can tell, we've been to the beach. <laughs> I walked in this morning and Matt goes, are you sure you went to the beach? I said, I promise, we were at the beach. We just, this is as good as it gets in the summertime. <laughs> So it got me thinking while we were down there because it was so hot, so hot. We were all the way down in Panama City. Who prefers summer? If you say, oh, summer is the life for me, I love the heat, give me the sunshine. Raise your hands, put them back up. Oh, there's the summer people. Okay. And then where's my, give me the fall and winter, I want sweaters. Yes. The sweating is not for me. Mm -mm. <laughs> I love them both. I honestly, there's times, um, I don't know which it is that I love more, but I'll tell you one thing for sure. I'm thankful for the beautiful weather that we've had. Go ahead and stand up with us this morning as we go to worship. Since Jesus came into my heart. I'm so thankful that we can say this. Here we go. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart.
may be seated. Good morning, Oak Hill. It is good to see you all here this morning. If you're a guest with us today, we're thrilled you're here with us this morning. On the seat right in front of you is a blue connection card. You take just a few minutes, put some basic information on there. We'd love to have a record of you being with us this morning, and uh, it's good to have you guys here. Uh, a few announcements, first of all. Uh, baptism is, uh, is going to be Sunday, July the 10th. So if, it, if it's you, you're like, hey, listen, I've never followed through with that or taken part in that, then that's going to be uh, set up for July the 10th. You can register for that online, oakhillbaptist.com slash baptism. So we'd love to have, have a record of, of have you participate in us with that service coming up, all right? Uh, a few announcements. First of all, it's camp. So when you guys came in today, uh, there's a basket full of names back there. There's some names over here. And these are our prayer bracelets. We have a hundred, and as of right now, I think we're at 156 uh, Oak Hill students and leaders going to camp tomorrow. All right. So, so we're thrilled about that. We're excited about that. Uh, we're going to meet here at 8 o'clock in the morning if your student's going with us, and we'll get them signed up in the morning. I uh, just got back from Texas and was at the Texas camp this week. Uh, we saw 25 students come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior this last week in Texas. So, so, so we're very, very excited. So the whole time I was sitting there in Texas going, hey, man, this camp is awesome. And camp's going well. I love the band. I love the speaker that we have coming in for, uh, for our camp next week. I love everything about it. And the whole time I'm just sitting there like, I just can't wait till next week when, when Oak Hill's here. And uh, so there's going to be about 1,000 campers at Camp Chautauqua starting tomorrow. And um, I think God's got some amazing things for us this coming week. I need your help in a couple ways. Number one, I need you to pray. Because we, we all know that I believe God's got some big things for us. And I believe that Satan will do some small things to try to distract us and all those things. So pray that everything goes smooth, that the vehicles and all that stuff goes well. And also, we are sponsoring uh, several students that want to go. I'm like, hey, if you want to go to camp, we, will, we want you to go. So if you guys could help me send a student to camp, that, that would be very, very helpful. Uh, the cost for a student going this year is a three hundred dollars. It's been about the same now for about seven, eight, ten years right now. So we're thankful for that. But uh, I just can't tell you how excited I am about tomorrow. Uh, I can't wait to get all the. You know, we got all the buses and stuff lined up over here, and I can't wait to roll in there with one hundred fifty plus uh, Oak Hill students. And I'm excited to see. Uh, there's several students going with us that I don't even personally know very well. So I'm excited to see uh, those students come to know Jesus. I'm excited to see our students do business with God. And I'm, going to, and I'm also praying that we'll have some students that will surrender to ministry. Uh, I, I think it's great right now that we have several students in, in different Bible colleges, and I pray that's something that will continue, uh, that we have students that love the Lord and want to serve the Lord. So uh, can you guys pray for us this week? That would be very, that would be awesome. We'd love to have that. And let's go to prayer right now. God, we love you today. Thank you for, uh, for loving us like you do. God, we're thankful for your goodness. We're thankful to be in your house this morning, be in your presence this morning. God, I pray to be with our students in camp tomorrow. Uh, God, it's, um, I just, uh, our hearts are full. We're excited to see what you have for our students. God, I love our students so much. And God, and, and we trust in you. We trust in your goodness. And I pray that you just give uh, our students the wisdom and the courage to respond to you this week, God, how you want them to. And I pray that you just bless our students and uh, get us there, God, tomorrow safely. And God, we're just excited to see what you have for us this coming week. And God, I'm thankful that we're, uh, to be able to serve you at a church, God, that loves middle school and high school students, and we're so thankful for that. And all these things we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alan. Well, it's good to see you this morning. We're going to pray this week for camp and pray that God would just speak through, um, speak through those folks that are going to run the camp and then also for the speakers and the music, everything. I know that God does amazing things when you get kids away from their environment. When you can just get them along with God, he can do some amazing things. We're going we're gonna to receive communion this morning. So I want us to begin to prepare our hearts. If you do not have a communion cup or you do not have bread, would you raise your hand really high? Uh, folks are going to come around. Um, the Bible says on the night before Jesus was arrested, he had 12 of his disciples went into the upper room for the last meal. And from this day forward, the entire course of human history would be changed. Nothing would be like it was ever before. And at the end of the supper, Jesus picked up a piece of bread and he broke it. He began to institute the first ordinance of communion. So when we come together and we receive communion, first, of all, we cleanse our hearts and we ask God to um, 
take away the sin. Now, if you would confess Christ, then you have you know that He's your Lord and Savior. You've confessed Him as your Lord and Savior. Then you're part of His family, and as part of your His family, you have this opportunity to come before Him and uh, remember Him because Jesus is the bread of life. He shed his blood so that you and I could be free, could, could have hope for eternity. And this is why we do communion. Communion is about remembering what Jesus Christ did for us because we can never forget it, um, ever. One day we're going to be in his presence. We're going to be reminded every moment of every day of every year what Jesus Christ did and who he truly is. But today, as we remember him, we remember his body, we remember the brokenness, we remember the blood. Today, as we remember this, let us, let, let us uh, take a moment and let us examine our hearts. Because the Bible says, do not come to the Lord's table in an unworthy way. And I don't know about you, but I'm never worthy enough to receive communion. I'm never worthy enough to partake of the bread and partake of the juice. I'm never worthy enough to do that. But I don't come because I'm worthy enough. I come because Jesus is worthy enough. I come because he took my sin. And he took all of my sin. That he, the, uh, every, every sin I could ever commit, every sin I'm ever going to commit, and he took them to the cross and he died and shed his blood so that you and I could be free. So let's take a moment. I want you to stand with me with your heads bowed. We're going we're gonna to take a moment. I'm just going to have them to play. I'm going to open the altars up. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I don't want you to take partake of the Lord's Supper without knowing Him as your Lord and Savior. It, that would be taking it in an unworthy way. Maybe there's unconfessed sin in your life. Maybe you have sin that you've not confessed. You're, you're not real close to the Lord right now, then right now, either there at your seat or here at the altar, why don't you confess that to him? Why don't you ask him right now, Lord, would you clean me up, make me pure, make me whole, help me, Lord, to realize exactly what you've done for me, because I want to spend my life in your presence, and I don't want to take this supper, this don't want to come to this table unworthy. So you take a moment and reflect and we're going to pray. I pray, Lord, that we can walk worthy of what you've done for us at Calvary. Thank you for providing the way. Thank you for giving us the hope, the joy that we have in being a child of yours. And I'm so thankful today that you gave your life for me. So, Lord, as we prepare ourselves to receive communion, would you accept from us the praise, the glory,
glory and the honor that you deserve for what you did. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself. In verse 23, for I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Jeff Eads, would you care to lead us in a word of prayer? After the same manner, he also took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it, and remember it to me. For as oft as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. shed at Calvary I praise you Lord for giving us life and hope Lord if you had not shed your blood there would be no forgiveness no remission of sins and so today because of the blood that you shed for me Lord I don't I, I've been forgiven don't have to enter eternity worry don't have to worry that I'll ever be separated from you because I've accepted what you did and I know standing on the word of God that you've received my offering of repentance and so Lord today we're able to do that because you shed your blood and I'm thankful for that so Lord I praise you today as we praise you through the rest of the service, may you be glorified and honored. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Stay standing. We're going to sing.
until I see you face to face until at last I've won my race remind me Right, good morning, church. It is good to be with you again today. We're going to we're going to start a new series on the book of Ephesians. I want to go through this book over the next few weeks, and I want to look at specifically the goodness of God um, as it's written as Paul wrote to this church. So, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one. I want to speak for just a moment about the decision that was came down this weekend about abortion. For the first time in many, many years, we have finally restored some sanity in America. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. Well, this weekend, we finally chose life in this country and we slow down the insanity of slaughter in 63 million babies in the womb. In 2019, approximately 19%, almost 20% of all pregnancies ended in abortion. And the left doesn't like it because they have proved that what they really had in mind all along uh, was murdering the baby right up until the time of birth. It was never really about abortion to them. It's always been about convenience because 95% of all of the, the abortions in this country were done and the mother and the baby were never at risk of serious injury or cases of rape. Just 1% of women obtained an abortion because they got pregnant through rape and less than 0.5% do so because of incest. But that's not the statistics that you hear in the mainstream media for keeping abortion alive. And even if we went back to the original ruling of Roe versus Wade, the original ruling was only allowed in the first trimester. Well, we've long blown past that. Proverbs 6, verse 16 and 17 says, There are six things the Lord hates. Seven that are abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Certainly killing the baby in the womb has been by hands that shed innocent blood. Let's now pray for God's mercy upon this country and that God would open the eyes of the people that don't see it the way he does. Amen? Let's pray together. Father... I pray now for this country. I pray for the Supreme Court justices. I pray for our leaders. There's so much division and so much hate in this country. And I pray that we could overcome that by you. By you changing the hearts of the people of America Lord, that we would preserve this right to protect an innocent baby. And so, Lord, I pray as we go forward that you would help us to stand on the side of truth. And, Lord, that you would be lifted up and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1. Have you ever just stopped and thought about 
all of the good things that God does for us every day? He does so much, doesn't he? So many things that we don't even know about. Some of us grew up with the slogan, I think it was Maxwell House Coffee. What is the slogan? Good to... That's God, isn't it? God is good. He's good in everything he does. He's perfect. So think about this. What is God's goodness in your life? Is it related to an object? Is it related to a person? I hope it is. <laughs> is it related to a prayer that you prayed? In the English Bible, the word goodness often translates to that quality in God that causes him to bless his people, deliver his people, and store up future gifts for them. So it implies this sense of delight or one giving of a gift or a gift that's given. But God goes beyond dictionary definition. He actually reveals his goodness in a person. God reveals his goodness in Jesus Christ. Steve Estes once wrote this. He said, God, like a father, doesn't just give advice or give gifts. He gives himself. He becomes the husband to the grieving widow. He becomes the comforter to the bearing woman. He becomes the father of the orphan. He becomes the bridegroom to the single person. He's the healer to the sick. He's the counselor, the wonderful counselor to the confused and the depressed. A.W. Pink says God is the highest good. God is the only and greatest of all beings, but not only good and great, but the best. God is the greatest being. He's the best being. To most people, the depression in the 30s has been forgotten in the wave of prosperity that came after all those years. But out of those hard times came a lot of stories. And there was one story of an elderly lady who once walked into an insurance office in Minneapolis. And with a trembling hand, she took out her well-worn purse, an old insurance policy, and she explained regretfully that she was unable to meet the current premiums on that policy. And she said it's just too hard for her to get work at her age, and what little she did have was hard, hardly enough to clothe and to feed her and keep a roof over her head, but she could no longer afford the premiums. After quick investigation, the clerk realized that the policy was very valuable. And so he warned the lady that she was making an unwise move to stop the payments. And he asked her, he said, what does your husband have to say about stopping the payments since this policy is under his name and you are the beneficiary? And the lady said with a sad, with a sad voice, sir, my husband died just three years ago. Immediately, the company officials went into action. They soon discovered that she was telling the truth. And what she had not understood was that policy was in her husband's benefit, but she was a beneficiary. And so the money she got was enough to take care of her for the rest of her life. In the same kind of a way, the introduction to the book of Ephesians was written because it's written to Christians who may not take advantage of the spiritual resources, the good things that God has already given us, and they're already at our disposal. This book has the title, actually it has the title, The Treasure House of the Bible. Why the treasure house of the Bible? Because it tells of Christians, it tells Christians of their riches, their inheritance, the rewards. Listen, I, you and I have riches that are beyond comprehension in our minds. If you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Jesus has transformed your heart, then you have access to the greatest of all riches of the universe. And God's bank never runs dry. During the Depression, many banks would not allow their customers to withdraw any more than 10% of their accounts during any given time because the banks didn't have enough reserves. 
to cover all the deposits. But God's bank doesn't have any restrictions. God's bank never runs dry. God's bank always has resources and is available to every person who's willing to access it through Jesus Christ. And there is no reason for a Christian to be spiritually deprived. There's no reason to be malnourished. Why? Because we have every spiritual resource at our disposal. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Let's read in verse 1 of Ephesians 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, in Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Let me start off by telling you that, of course, this book was written by Paul to the church at Ephesus. In verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. So Paul is in Rome. He's in prison. But the saints of Ephesus were on his mind. And he wanted to encourage them and he wanted to remind them of the goodness of the riches of the inheritance of Jesus. That's what I'd like to do with you this morning. And we have to understand, Paul's in prison, but Paul's not prison. He's in prison, but the prison bars, he is looking way beyond those and he's trying to encourage the saints. And Ephesians mentions riches five times, grace is mentioned 12 times. Glory is mentioned eight times. Fullness or field is mentioned six times. In Christ or in him is mentioned 12 times. And the idea of in, with, or through Christ is mentioned 30 times. So this is book, this book is really about the overwhelming infinite wealth that we all have in the Lord Jesus. Believers are amazingly rich because of our relationship with Jesus. So Paul says that you have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, I don't know if you really understand this or not, but the Father, God the Father, has made us all rich in Jesus Christ. When you were born, you were born, when you were born again, actually, into the family of God, we were literally born rich. And it's the rich, the, the spiritual riches of, of Jesus Christ, of the Lord, that is greater than money. It, it, as a matter of fact, the riches that I'm talking about puts money down here on the very, very bottom. Romans chapter 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might that we may also be glorified with him. 
And so Christ, uh, God confers on the people, the saints of God, our adoption into his family. When you become a child of God, you're adopted into the family of God. 1 Peter 1, 4 says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. I'm glad God keeps it in heaven. I'm glad that nothing can take it away. I'm glad that nothing can steal it. Nothing can take it away. We've been having some trouble with our vans out here. People stealing gas out of them and cutting the hoses and cutting uh, catalytic converters off of them. I mean, it's unbelievable. What the, you know, my wife said this the other, to me the other day. I can't believe they do that at church. That's where we've come to in this country. Because people do not do not understand who God is. There's consequences for what you do in this life. And listen, it may not come because we caught you stealing something. But God doesn't forget anything. And one day you're going to have to stand before him and you're going to have to give an account. Someone suggested this. You get on heaven's payroll by faith. But now that you're on the payroll, you earn wages for eternity. I like that. The rewards we gain here on earth are not like the rewards uh, the rewards we gain in heaven are not like the rewards we gain here on earth. We tend to think of it in material, don't we? Material things, money, home, whatever. But the things that in heaven are, uh, are, are completely different. Somebody wrote this. What we gain in heaven is actually, uh, what we gain in heaven is a only a representation of what God is going to do in our lives. A child who wins a spelling bee treasures the trophy he receives, not for the sake of the trophy itself, but for what that trophy means. The Bible talks about crowns. You're going to receive a crown. The Bible uh, mentions five, the incorruptible crown. The crown of righteousness, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of glory, the crown of life. The crown of the incorruptible, also called the victor's crown. That's for the one who obeys the Lord's command and made self-sacrifice and disciplined his life to obey God. Think about Paul. Paul said, I bring my body under subjection to the Spirit of God. I bring my body under subjection. I don't allow my body to have everything at once. There's a crown of righteousness for those that love his appearing. That means everybody who is in love with Jesus Christ and looking for the coming of Jesus Christ, and that dominates their life. That's how they look forward into the future. You're going to receive a crown. There's a crown of rejoicing, the soul winner's crown. You rejoice when you have someone that you uh, are able to bring to Jesus. Listen, I have a couple of people right now that's really on my heart. I actually took one, a, a book this weekend, and I, I'm praying that they will read that book and, and they'll, they'll, they'll come to Christ. And I, I've talked with them a number of times. There's a crown of rejoicing, the soul winner's crown, the crown of glory, shepherd's crown, that's for the elders or pastors or teachers, the crown of life for the, for the guy who went through persecution and trial and was martyred for Jesus' sake. And so there's crowns, there's blessings, but I want you to think about how blessed we are while we're here. Let me give you just some of the blessings. There's so many more, but I want to mention some of the blessings that you have. Number one is you have everything you need for life. God has not left out anything. You have everything you need for life. Now let's get in our minds, let's get away from money for just a moment. Because money is what this world operates on, but it's useless in God's economy. Actually, God uses it as a pavement. (laughs) Money has no intrinsic value with God because God created this world out of nothing. God's riches are much greater than money. That's why it is so frustrating that I can turn on the television and I can see evangelists that exclusively talk about money. Plant a seed, and by giving me X amount of dollars, then God's going to bless you with more. How about talking about Jesus and his eternal riches? How about talking about the riches of his grace that we have in Jesus Christ, that we, are, uh, we have his Holy Spirit to discern the truth and, 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 and 
not have to live by the shackles of this world. We're not held in bondage to, to this, the enemy. Listen, you can have plenty of earthly riches and have nothing significant in heaven. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, the Greek word for blessing is a word which means benefit. The spiritual blessings that Paul referred to weren't just nice ideas. These were realities. Let me say it to you like this. Let's praise Jesus Christ for the spiritual blessings that Christ has brought to all of us from heaven. What has Christ brought to us from heaven? What are those spiritual blessings? Well, here's just a couple of them. Number one is you were chosen in him. You were chosen. God planned for our salvation all the way back before this world was even created. Now, listen to me in just a moment. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those that were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, think of it like this. God always knew that there would be a need for a Savior. And when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to give us an opportunity to accept him as Lord and Savior. And if you're you're here today and you've done that, you've invited him into your heart to save you and forgive you your sins, you're one of his children chosen to live with God forever in heaven. And it comes by Jesus Christ. Verse 4 says, even after he chose us in him, before for the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. God chose us, but we had to choose him as well. And because we uh, uh, did that, because we chose him, he's given us every spiritual blessing. Now, some people get all wrapped up in the choosing part. I've heard, I've heard uh, pastors that just talk about this and talk about this and talk about this. And they say, well, we don't actually have a free will to choose God or not choose God, but he chose us, and he wants us to go to heaven, and, and, he, and he chose some to go to hell. No. Now, listen to me. If we say, don't worry about the lost because God's going to save them and choose those he's elected and condemn those he's not elected, then, folks, you aren't reading the same Bible that I'm reading. I like how one person puts it. If our theology leads us to write off the majority of the human race as hopeless cause, then perhaps we need to check our theology with the Bible. So don't get caught up in the choosing part. Just realize that the blessing is that God provided Jesus Christ, that I had the opportunity to know that this man, Jesus Christ, could forgive me of my sin. And I could go to God because he's my mediator. I could go to God. Here's the second spiritual blessing. You are holy and blameless. The last part of verse 4 says that we should be holy and blameless before him. In Christ Jesus, you're considered holy and blameless. That means that you are fit to serve him and worship him despite your sins and, and your shortcomings. That was really important because none of us really honestly think about it. None of us really deserve to do the work of God, do we? We don't deserve to teach a class. I don't deserve to be a pastor. I'm just as sinful. I dwell on earth among sinful people. But God is holy and and he can't dwell among sin. But it was through Jesus Christ that I received my forgiveness. And it's through him that God looks at me. When he looks at me, he don't see my sin. And listen, can I just say this? Well, that just means I'm going to go out and sin, do whatever I want to. No, if that's the way you think about it, then you better get back to the Bible. Because the Bible don't teach that at all. As a matter of fact, it teaches opposite that. If you know him, if you are a child of his, then you will not willfully sin. And when you do and you know that you've sinned, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit is going to bring you to your knees. And he's got a good way of doing that, doesn't he? Isaiah, when he got a vision of God, he found himself in the throne room. Isaiah 6, verse 5, Woe is me, for I'm lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Let me, let me translate that for you. Isaiah said, I'm doomed. <laughs> Everything I say is sinful, and, and, and so are the words of everyone around me, yet I find myself in the, in the presence of the powerful Lord God King. He knew that's a place that he shouldn't be because he was a sinful man. I love what happened. Here's what God did. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he'd taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt's taken away and your sin's atoned for. That live coal that came from the altar where sin had been dealt with, and that live coal represents the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from our sins. So when you and I got received forgiveness of sins, we got everything that Jesus had to offer us. And we can live holy and blameless before him in love. Here's the second thought. Not only do you have everything for life, but you have the special privilege of being called family. We have a lot of friends. I, I, I mean, I hope you have a lot of friends. I have, I have quite a few. Some of us have friends that have been friends all of our lives. And you become so close with them that you, they almost become family. But they're actually not your blood. They're very close to you, but they're, they're not completely your family. They're like family, but they're not actually family. Well, I want you to know that when you and I come to God through Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we are adopted into his family. We are brought right into his family, just like a son and daughter, and we're treated just like a son and daughter. I have friends that are as close to my family as you could get, but can you imagine one of your friends coming over your, your house sometime after you go to bed, getting in your refrigerator and just using the stove and fixing them something to eat and leaving the dishes to, for you to wash the next morning? Or just showing up at your house unannounced? Going to your bathroom, taking a shower, throwing their dirty laundry in your hamper and just walking out expecting you to wash their clothes and fold them. They probably wouldn't be friends very long, would they? <laughs> but let me ask you another question. Can you see one of your sons or one of your daughters doing that? Yes. Yes. Why? They're your closest family. Verse 5 says, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In other words, the very minute that you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, our position immediately changed. No longer do we just know about God, but now we are in the position to know God. We are his family. It's different. My family knows me. They know everything about me. They know my good and they know my bad. They know my struggles and my pain. They know when I'm happy and when I'm sad. They walk through all the things that I walk through. And I know that they're there for me and they love me and they would do anything to help me. Can you imagine how it is with your heavenly father? Can you imagine the God of heaven, the very creator of this world, the creator of mine and your life, being our father, loving us as father, guiding us as father? Father, listening to us as Father, can you imagine what are the privileges that we have as family? Number one is your, His glorious grace. Verse 6 says, to the praise of His glorious grace. Grace means unmerited or undeserved favor. There are 131 uses of grace in the New Testament. 86 of those are mentioned by the Apostle Paul. That, which means two-thirds of all the uses of the word grace in the Bible are from one author. They're from Paul. And no wonder he's called the Apostle of Grace. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 says, We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so grace is what God gives us free undeserving as sinners. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, God's able to make all grace abound toward you, that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So his grace is unmerited, it's, it's, it's undeserved, but his favor overflows 
into our lives. And so in Christ, this abundant measure of unmerited favor is flowing into our life, and it's flowing there because we are children of God the Father. You're children of the creator of this world. You are part of his family, and he loves you, and he cares about you. And not only his glorious grace, but here's another one, his favor. His favor. Verse 6 says, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, if you have a King James Bible, it says that we are accepted in the beloved. Now, if you look the word up in the Greek, you'll find that it actually means endued with special favor or highly favored. You and I are highly favored. Think about that for just a moment. You could say, you could say that God's favor is giving us the ability to do something which is humanly possible to do. For example, it's only by God's undeserved favor that we can experience eternal life. You cannot get to God any other way than coming through Jesus Christ. That's God's favor. But because I have the special privilege of being called family, and God's favor is on my life, then I can actually come to God for anything I need. Hebrews 4.16 says, you know, let us come with confidence and draw near to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy in time of need, that God gives us that favor. I know that I have a heavenly Father that cares for me. Psalm 5.12 says, for you bless the righteous, O Lord, you cover him with favor as a shield. Psalm 90, 17, let the favor of the Lord God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And so here's the goodness of God. You have everything we need. You have the special privilege of being called family. But here's something else and the most important. You have the freedom of being forgiven. Now, The problem is sometimes we think we're pretty good. And we don't actually need to be forgiven of anything. I've never seen a day like it is today. We are living in a time where Judges chapter 17 verse 6 says, In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The world would like to think there's no king. There's no standard. There's no right and wrong, but we are wrong. All of us are wrong. Our sin nature is wrong. And we have this unique opportunity to be forgiven of everything that we have going on in our life. C.S. Lewis once said this, the trouble with us is that what we call asking God's forgiveness very often really consists of asking God to accept their excuses. But what we've got to take to him is the inexcusable act of sin. We're only wasting our time talking about all the parts which can be excused. When you go to a doctor, you show him what's wrong, say a broken arm, it would be a mere waste of time to keep on explaining that your legs and throat and eyes are all right. There is something terribly wrong. If your arm is broke, you need a doctor to do his magic and to heal your arm. Folks, my body, my body is broken. That's a fact. The minute I came to the knowledge of right and wrong, I had to choose a path. I had to choose Jesus because I need him to receive the forgiveness of sin, being separated from God in a lost world. Listen, you will never get to God unless you come through the only person that is a mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. You must come to him. But here's the goodness of God. My sins have been forgiven. Have yours. Verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, 
which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So my, my question as we close today is do you realize, do you realize what you have in, in Jesus Christ? Do you realize who you are in him? Do you realize that every spiritual blessing, every one of them, was given so that you and I could live on this earth in a relationship to God in such a way that he would be the Lord of our lives, that through our life we would affect other people. Through your life, every single day, I told my, one of my kids this last night, every single day through your life you should be affecting other people for Christ. They should look at your life and say, wow, you've got something different. If nobody ever tells you you're different, every, nobody ever says, oh, you don't want to be different, do they? I want to be different in a good way, in a spiritual way. I, somebody ought to look at you and just say, listen, you've got something that I'd like to have. I can be friends with the lost world. I can get out there and I can sit and talk to them. But I can't be really close with them. Here's why. Because they have got to come to the understanding that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And I serve him. I don't serve sin. I don't serve Satan. I don't live for any of those things. And listen, I don't want what's wrong in my life. I want it gutted out of my life. I want all that's good. I want the favor of God upon me. And I want to live for him. And then one day I'm going to enter his presence. And we're going to have a time of rewards. That's called the uh, uh, judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be uh, given rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. It, sound, it almost sounds like, oh, am I going to be judged? No, if not, if you've been forgiven of your sins. But what you're going to do is you're going to go, and they also call it the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is, the, is maybe a better term. But at that marriage supper of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to give me a reward. And I actually spoke to one of my children last night about this. He was asking me, and here's what I said. You and I, and I don't completely understand. Maybe I'll do a study on that. You and I don't completely understand how important those rewards are going to be until we're standing or kneeling or on our face in front of Jesus Christ, and he's actually giving us that reward, and we're able to put it back at his feet. We don't understand that. Why? Because we're still on earth. But one day, we're going to get in his presence, and one day, he's going to look at us, and hopefully, he's going to say, good job, my servant. <laughs> well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter the joy of the Lord, and we will never, ever be separated again. That is a wonderful promise. Amen? Stand to your feet. Father, I pray that you would bless us with the assurance and the hope that we know where we're going to be one day as we spend eternity in your presence. So, Lord, I pray that you would just help us to realize those things that we have that we sometimes forget. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here in the sound of my voice that doesn't know you personally as Lord and Savior, I pray that this would be the morning that they would come to you. This would be the day they would give their life to you. If there's someone here that's a Christian, that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they have invited you into their life, but they are not living where they need to be, and they're not experiencing these things that we talked about today, I pray that this would be the day where they'd make that right with you. So, Lord, would you speak through the Holy Spirit to our hearts, and we'll thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The invitation's open. If you need to come, you come as we sing. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him See
Mark Isaac, would you care to close us in a word of prayer? Bless you.